As you can imagine, I've learned a lot about life from my 30 years working in the Hollywood film industry and from the characters that I met, interesting, famous characters. We all love characters, don't we? Especially in films. We become invested in, in good characters. We care about them. We identify with them. And we might live a little vicariously through them. But what about real life? We can say that someone's a character because they're a little outrageous. I don't know, they're, they're odd. And we say, oh, he's such a character. Oh, what a character. <laughs> But we're all characters in our own story. We have our highs and our lows, comedy, drama. And from the moment we're born, we're evolving into the person we were meant to be. We're doing this by being open to life's possibilities, living spontaneously without fear, and trusting that the plot twists are there for a reason. When I was 13 and taking Pittman shorthand at school, I had no idea that one day this secret language that I loved would one day open doors for me in Hollywood. I also loved acting, so maybe that was a sign. Well, since I grew up in an era where little girls should be seen and not heard, taking up acting when I was 13 gave me a voice. But when I left school, it was secretarial work for me. And I did amateur dramatics in the evening. That's where I met my husband. We were both passionate about acting, but I didn't really appreciate having to work three jobs to support us while he went full-time to drama college. He was really living the life I wanted. But, you know, I was old-fashioned, and I thought, well, he's the man. He should fulfill his dream, and I'll just play the part of a good little wife. I was very lonely in my marriage. And since neither of us wanted children, I was trying to figure out what my life was all about. Just, just to shake things up a bit, I, I took a course in beauty therapy and electrolysis. But sticking electric needles into ladies' faces to remove superfluous hair was really not for me. And it didn't help my marriage either. In desperation, I swallowed a bottle of codeine pills well, I was unsuccessful in ending my life, you know, I'm here. And, but it was the end of my marriage, I realized that. But what next? Drama had always given me confidence when I was young. So I applied to university to teach theater in education. Well, that was okay, except that I didn't have the necessary qualifications. But because I was 26 and a mature student, and because I gave a convincing and passionate presentation about the need for creative self-expression in children, I was accepted, but not until the following year. What did I do? I went to Switzerland to become an au pair. I thought working with children would help. It would give me an idea of what, what they were getting in the home. I worked with three children, and I did all the household duties. I was a glorified maid and not part of the family. I would go up to my room in the attic and look out at the wonderful view of Lake Zurich and the Alps, and I was miserable. I'd made friends with a Canadian au pair, and we both decided we'd had enough of cleaning floors and making cookies. So we headed for Stuttgart, where we were told we could get work at an American army hospital. My friend got in because she was a nurse. Oh, what do you do, ma'am? Asked the personnel lady. Well, I'm a secretary. Great! We need a secretary in charge of the drug abuse program. Okay. The first day on the job, I'm sitting in my office. And this GI, little chubby GI, comes in and fatigues. He has a huge plastic bag slung over his shoulder. And he said, are you the drug lady, ma'am? I said, oh, I, yeah. And he threw the bag on my desk and out rolled these little plastic bottles of urine. I was kind of shocked, all these different colors. I had no idea there were so many different colors of urine. And the, the bottles were labeled with the name of the soldier and the unit that he belonged to in the area of Germany. My job was to send the samples to an independent uh, German lab for drug testing. 
when the test came back positive, I had to hospitalize the soldier. Then every day, the soldier would come down into the, into the lab and pee in a bottle. Now, he was supposed to be supervised by the sergeant in charge, but because the sergeant was too embarrassed to watch this <laughs> soldier pee in a bottle, he would look the other way, and the soldier would substitute someone else's urine. So the whole drug abuse program was a complete farce, as was the, the therapy group that I belonged to. It was a weekly therapy group, and there were army psychiatrists and th so-called therapists there. And I was just shocked at the way they spoke to these young men. I mean, they, these guys, they were kids, really. They were 18, 19, and they'd just come from Vietnam. And they were traumatized, traumatized by the horrible things they'd seen. And yet, here were these army psychiatrists yelling at them and putting them down. And it was called below-the-belt therapy. And I challenged it. So here am I, a civilian, a little naive, perhaps. But I'm speaking up against the system. I did it because I cared about these young men. And I also thought of all the times I never spoke up because I didn't feel good enough. I was championing the underdog. And Mark gave me the courage to do that, to face up to these so-called professionals in their field. It was simply a gut feeling I had, a voice in my head, something really strong that really I couldn't control. I needed to do it, regardless of the consequences to myself. This was a turning point for me, and a large arc in my character development. Now, I was supposed to go back to England to go to university. The time was coming. I'd worked six months at the hospital. But something was telling me, you need to move on. You, you, there's more to discover. And I had this thirst to discover more. I wanted to do it. So I decided to pass on the university and, and not go, go back to England. And instead, I continued to travel. So there were more countries, more interesting jobs, and defining experiences, such as living with Palestinian Arabs in the old city of Acre, Israel. They had been uprooted from their, their natural home and had been away from there for many years, waiting to go back. And we know how that ended. But you know what? They were so welcoming to me and kind, as were a family of French Moroccan Jews in the new city of Acre. Both cultures, even though the country was in conflict and they were in conflict, they gave me shelter. We didn't speak the same language. But because I was open and respectful and trusting, really, of these wonderful people, they treated me the same way. It was language of the heart, really. So now I've experienced a lot on my travels. And by the time I went to Hollywood, I thought, oh, I'm pretty much ready for anything because I have experienced real-life dramas. So I arrived in Hollywood, and the first job I got was with the Samuel Goldwyn Company. Now, I'm a strong believer in creative visualization. It's worked for me many times. And it worked for me with this job, with getting a film job with Samuel Goldwyn. I was the first to be interviewed, and 25 people were interviewed after me. And yet, I knew I had the job. And I visualized telling people, oh yes, I work for Goldwyn, it was so great, it's a great job, going into the studio every day. And I see myself on the phone, hello, Samuel Goldwyn Company. And even when I had to open a new bank account, and it said place of employment, I put the Samuel Goldwyn Company. I was actually a temp at the time. I suppose it was my, well, I know it was my English and shorthand skills that got me through the door. But it was my reputation working in television in Canada that sealed the deal. Although I'd never worked in film in the States, they checked, out, checked me out and they said, 
you know, she's, she's got a good reputation. So I always say to people, be careful what impression you leave. Don't burn bridges. Be kind. Be nice. Do a good job. Do the best job you can do. People will appreciate you for it, and they'll talk about you and give you a reference. Eventually, I started working for Barry Levinson. He's a writer-director. You may have heard of him. With my shorthand skills, I helped him write screenplays, which also led to me casting characters in the films. But it also gave me an opportunity to experience the lives of others beyond the story being told in the film. On Good Morning Vietnam, the 17-year-old Vietnamese boy who was cast opposite Robin Williams had made it to Chicago after escaping Vietnam by boat with his family when he was 10. It was a terrifying journey for all of them. Their boat was attacked three times by Thai pirates and all their belongings stolen. A pirate threatened to cut off his mother's hand if she didn't relinquish her jade bracelet. Now, here's this young man in Thailand seven years later, and you think he'd be full of anger and resentment towards the Thai people, but no. He said that all of that hatred was erased by the kind heart he encountered and the bonds he made. He said he was given a chance to be a better human being and was forever grateful for it. Wow, what a guy. I'm proud to say that this young man and many Vietnamese I cast in the film have, been my, have become my lifelong friends. They have shown me that regardless of your background or culture, we're all human beings on a journey of self-discovery and character building. When I was working on Rain Man, I, I was casting, and I had to go into a home for the disabled. I was actually a little anxious, nervous, if you like, because I didn't know what to expect. What I found were unique individuals, all completely different from one another, in mind, body, and spirit. I connected with one young lady, and she showed me the beauty of people who seem to be trapped in their bodies. Her name was Cindy. She had red hair, rosy cheeks, bright blue eyes. She was confined to a wheelchair and only had the use of one arm, and her vocal skills were limited. But she could laugh. What a laugh she had. I just fell in love with her. So I thought, oh, I've got to have her in the movie. So I've got my Polaroid camera. You remember Polaroid? <laughs> Took a photo of her and uh, put it in my book. Wrote all the details about her. And looked back, and her face was long. She was sad. So, and I said to the carer, what did I do? Why, why is she sad? She said, oh, don't worry about it, she said. Cindy thought you were going to give her the photo. I said, no problem, I can, I can take another one. So I did, I took the photo and waited for it to develop a little bit, you know, the Polaroid. And I gave it to Cindy, and her face lit up. And she grabbed my arm, and she started kissing it. Wow. Any fear or prejudice or any feeling I had completely disappeared with that wonderfully loving gesture. This was another example of a culture that was foreign to me, where I learned that we're basically all the same inside. Just like the famous actors I worked with, we're all looking to be acknowledged and appreciated for who we are. It's a human need. Looking back on my life, I can see how my character has been transformed by the paths I took and the fact that I trusted the plot twist. I returned to England in 2012, uh, which was unexpected and a bit of a twist, but it felt the right thing to do. I came back to spend time with an elderly aunt. She had been there for me when I was a child, and I want to be here for her now. Wherever your journey takes you, 
it's important to trust the process of life. Don't be afraid to take risks. Know that every crossroads is an opportunity for character growth. We're all here for a reason, to create character and to make a difference. I'd like to end with this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. I look to a day when people will be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. Thank you.